Hello everybody, I am Patrick Curran. I am Dan Bauer. And you are stuck with us again. This is Center Stat Unscripted. I made a slide <clears throat> like eight minutes ago while we were sitting here. Right. And what we're talking about? Episode seven. We're on episode, lucky episode seven. Lucky episode seven. Lucky Pig is gonna really enjoy like, this episode. So our highest viewer, you can track who watches these, and we have dozens and dozens of views from a page that's run by Lucky Pig, which right. is literally a pig. Yeah, our top referrer. Yeah, yeah our is. top referrer is Lucky Pig. Yeah. So thank goodness for bots. But um, welcome everybody. Today, what we're gonna talk about I think it's actually really cool because, well, not that everything else hasn't been cool, is um, we're going to talk about subgroup heterogeneity and, and population uh, moderation. And where this plays out in a lot of ways. Hey, before we start, right when we began, we've got, I got to show you, it's actually pretty cool. All right. This was the coolest thing we bought is it's these little uh, microphones that you can use and we clip them on. We clipped them on two minutes ago and they're all dead. And so we are working <laughs> off of the camera microphone. Um, can somebody who's watching type in to say if they if you can hear us okay? Because we could actually be talking to an empty room for all we know. If you can hear us okay, please let us know. Um, if not, we'll just keep talking and maybe it'll be more engaging if you can't hear us. Yeah, but it might have actually been a good thing. Exactly. Nice exactly. So, um, so we're going to talk about... What if you have an effect that you're studying somewhere in your model? And we'll talk about that a lot of what do we mean somewhere in the model. But you have an effect somewhere in your model that you think, think might vary as a magnitude of something else. And we learn this as an interaction when we first learn about regressions. But what we're going to see is we can scale that up in really cool ways. Audio is good. Slight echo. But oh, that's excellent. just your normal voice, I think. So. It is. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. All right, so All right. entertain so me, So let's Bauer. get started. Yeah, so we're going to start simple, and we're going to think about observed population heterogeneity where we have groups of individuals, and we know how many groups there are and who's in what group, and we think that the parameters of our model might differ between groups. We don't want to assume that one model holds for everybody. Maybe we need slightly different model parameter values or even largely different parameter values or even potentially different model structures for different groups of people. Right, so we're going to start kind of simple and say, well, how might this manifest in models that we're very familiar with, such as the regular regression model? And so I'm going to do it through path diagram form, and we'll say we have a predictor X, and our predictor is predicting some outcome Y, right? And the single-headed arrow here is the regression slope, right? And then we have some intercept as well that we don't really care that much about, and then we have the residual variance tacked on on the end there with that double headed error, right? So just a simple single predictor regression model. And if we have subgroups within our population, we might say, well, how do we know that the effect of X on Y is the same for each group, right? And what we would traditionally do in the regression model is we would say, okay, well, we can, we can put grouping variables into our regression model, right? That's not a problem. So we're gonna create a variable G and we're going to put that variable into our regression model too, right? And so we're going to let it have an effect on y, and we're going to account for the fact that x and g might co-vary with one another, right? There might be some correlation between our predictor of interest, x, and this grouping variable. So what does that get us? Well, it doesn't quite get us what we wanted, right? What we wanted was to say, well, the effect of x on y might differ across groups, and we haven't gotten there yet. All we've really done is control for G, right? There might be some association between X and Y, and now we get an effect of X on Y over and above any effect of G, right? What does that over and above mean? Well, G can also affect Y, right? So it could move the mean of Y up or down. We could have different group means. I'm right. going to be your voice activated visual graphical. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, you're going to draw the line. It is. So here's X. So here's X. Here's, here's y. y. All right. Now put your hand over G. All right, before not there. G goes in, we have one line that summarizes the relation between X and Y. That, if we don't do anything with, we assume holds in value for all individuals within the sample. All right, now, Dan, now undo the reveal. 
Okay, yeah, you can take it out. Now it's going to What that's going to allow is maybe we have a line for g equals zero, but because as Dan said, it moves the mean up, we can have another line for g equals one, but what is the characteristic of those two lines? Same slope. Same, Same relation. slope, right? We got one slope represented by this arrow, and all we've done is move the predicted value of y up or down as a function of what group you're in, but as Patrick nicely drew in, you're my Vanna White for today, right? We get the same shift no matter where we go, right? Now that, that can be kind of helpful, right? If we're trying to control for the fact that groups might have different distributions of X, right? One group might be higher on X, another group might be lower on X, and we want to, you know, account for that. But it's really not getting us to where we started in our question, which is, is the effect of X different for people in one group versus another? So we're still stuck with these parallel lines, right? We don't like that. By the way, this is kind of like what Nankova would look mm. like if you're familiar with that. Yep. Right. So we've got these parallel lines, and we've controlled for the association between X and G, but we haven't yet allowed the relationship between X and Y to differ. All right. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify our diagram a little bit. First, I'm going to think about it in terms of a conceptual diagram. So conceptually, what we want to do is not just have G affect the average value of Y, the intercept of these lines. We want to allow G to predict the slope of these lines. Ooh. Right. Ooh, moderation. Right. We want to allow that effect of X on Y. That model parameter that represents the slope for X predicting Y, we want to allow the value of that parameter to depend on G, not just the intercept of the line, but also the slope. You want to draw it in, Patrick? Right. Give, me, give me a line with right, the ready? slope. So what this we're going to do, tenure. there are two of the most important words of all of science are however and it depends. And so the however is, is you write your whole intro and then you say however, and then that leads to your paper. Here, when you say what is the relation between X and Y, we're going to say it depends. Are you in group zero? Or are you in group one? Because not only does grouping move your elevation, but it is also going to move the slope. And so if you have an it depends, maybe you have something like this, where there is a slope in group zero. So let's say beta G zero, but there is a different slope in group one, remember I, I did those lines where they were all equal, the differences? Well, now notice in this particular example, those differences get bigger as X goes up. So if your mom calls you on Sunday night and says, sweetie, what's the relation between X and Y? You say, it depends. Do you mean for people who are in group zero or people who are in group one? Exactly. All right, so we've got the conceptual diagram. How do we actually go about this? Well, we don't fit the model quite like that. What we do instead is we, in the regression setting, set up an X by G interaction term, right? We take the product of those two variables. So now we got three predictors in our regression model, and we put that arrow in there, right? And what's going to happen in the regression model is this arrow is going to give us that difference in slopes. This parameter, right? So we'll just call this B G zero. If we have the grouping variable coded zero one, that's going to be the effect of X and Y for the reference group. And then this parameter is going to be that difference in slope. How much is that slope going to be bigger or smaller by being in group one? Right, so that's how we actually mathematically go about getting this plot where we allow the effect of X and Y to differ across groups. All right, but what's wrong with that? Well, there's some limitations associated with this. Is it works okay in the context of a simple regression model where all we want to do is know is the slope of the effect of X on Y different from one group to another? Okay, cool. It works in that context. But what if we're interested in other model parameters? What if we think that there's more scatter around the regression line in group zero than there is in group one? Well, we've only got one residual variance parameter here, right? That's all we got. That's not group dependent. It's only in one group. 
right? A, a has to hold for both simultaneously. Homo skedasticity. Homo skedasticity. Constant variance assumption of the regression line. All right, okay, so we can't really do that by having these kinds of product terms in our model. There's, they're only going to take us so far. And they're not going to work out wonderfully when we move into more complex models. So for instance, let's say we wanted to do a factor analysis model. Now we're not just looking at regression slopes, right? We have factor means, we have factor variances, we have correlations between factors we might want to allow to differ across groups. We have factor loadings that we might want to allow to differ across groups, right? There are a lot more parameters and this product term is not going to get us to differences across groups in those other kinds of parameters. All right, so Patrick, you are a factor analysis I love guru. factor analysis. I don't know about the guru, but I do love it. So this is Can the source place. This is the source of the term subgroup heterogeneity, is if we only have main effects, we're saying, we're making a statistical statement that our population is homogeneous. That is, there's a single group of individuals and the relation between X and Y holds equivalently across all the individuals. Sometimes maybe in your reading or in your, home, your, your own work, you uh, encounter terms like um, population segmentation or population heterogeneity. And instead of having a single homogeneous population where we're looking for a single value that holds over all individuals, in our sample, because our sample is representative, hopefully, of our population, we actually have subgroups that are meaningful in some way. And if we assume, this is the big one, if we assume subgroup homogeneity, that there is no subgroups, right? And we estimate that one line when in reality there are two, that's a misspecified model. That one regression line is not gonna hold for either group zero or group one. You're screwing up both, all right? And so that's what the term subgroup heterogeneity means is that one or more parameters in our model want to obtain unique numerical values within each group. This is kind of crazy important in the work that we do, um, especially if we're doing anything where we're comparing things like biological sex or self-identified gender or religious group or racial group identification and we're drawing group comparisons this is insanely important because if you don't do this right you're going to draw invalid inferences about those subpopulations all right so as dan said in the regression model that actually works pretty well we still have to make some you know assumptions about homoskedasticity we have to make some other assumptions we don't talk about here um we have prior uh, episodes where we talk about why would you go from regression to SEM if you aren't part of our frequent flyer club and we appreciate all of you who are here. We really do. This has become kind of one of the highlights of our week and we really appreciate you being here. But um, let's scale it up to any path diagram that we can draw. And as Dan said, that um and because i draw it i'm going to put the indicators on top and there's nothing you can do about it dan draws all his factor models did i not so i this earlier i know um all right so let's say this is just going to be super simple is let's say we have five indicators and you know again is i i like uh depression all right is is we have a scale of depressive symptomatology and so Y1 is the first item, Y2 is the second, three, four, and five, all right? And so these are, you know, questions about, you know, I'm awful, often very low in energy. I feel lonely even when I'm around other people. Um, I sometimes fantasize about injuring myself because of my sadness, whatever your items are. And we believe that the reason that the items are correlated with one another is that they're all um, in part caused by an underlying shared factor. And indeed, sometimes this is called a common factor model because there's a factor that is common to all the items. It's really cool. And so we sometimes call this eta, all right? Ooh, that's a good eta. I'm usually pretty bad at these. So we're gonna call this eta, it's a Greek letter, and that's gonna be our just latent depression. All right, now each of these has a link that we're gonna call lambda, 
All right, these are the factor loadings. Now, what's really powerful about this, and we talked about this in prior episodes, is remember, and I was careful in using this example, one item is I sometimes feel lonely even when I'm around other people, and another item is, is I often fantasize about injuring myself. This model allows those to have differential relations to the underlying factor. If you just took a mean of those five items, you're saying they're all operating equivalently. And maybe they're not. I'm going to give my favorite Greek letter. Do you know what my favorite Greek letter is? It's the new. They're like these little elegant seagull kind of guys. These are the item intercepts. And this is just like an intercept in a multiple regression. And this is actually quite like a slope. A one unit change in eta is associated with a lambda unit change in the response. And these little news are the item intercept, the adjusted mean. So there are five of those, new one, new two, three, four, and five. And then we have our residual variances, sigma squared one, two, three, four, and five, if you can read my chicken scratch, all right? So this is pretty cool, right? Is that we have multiple indicator latent factors, we're estimating and removing the effects of unreliability, we have an estimate of the true underlying depression. One tiny problem, and it goes back to what I just said about population homogeneity versus segmentation or, or heterogeneity, which is that lambda, let's say it equals 0.72, all right? Then your sample, then you estimate it, all right? That's 0.72 for everybody, all right? Male, female, treatment, control, black, white, Catholic, Protestant, whatever it is, 0 0.72, 0 0.72, 0 0.72. Well, let's scale it up every time, every time I have to move you out of the way. Dan did his group variable. We can bring in, just like Dan did in the multiple regression, a grouping variable where this takes on a value of zero or one, all right? So say we have a control group and a treatment group, and we can say, wait, 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 wait. I can get this estimate, let's call it gamma one, that is, is, let's say that it, this takes on a positive value, all right, I'll put a little plus up here, that a one unit change in group membership, meaning moving from group zero to group one, has on average a higher mean of the latent factor. All right, that's kind of cool. And that's actually exactly what Dan just showed when uh, he had the multiple regression. All we did is instead of having a box with Y, we have a circle with eta. It's exactly the same thing. We can shift the mean. A neat thing is, and you don't often see this in practice, but it's pretty cool, is we can actually predict the item directly. And because we love, uh, 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 we love acronyms, this is sometimes called a mimic model. Multiple indicator, multiple cause. And what this represents, I kind of don't want to get it lost in the weeds of this, but what this represents is the G effect on eta is for the entire latent factor of depression. The G effect on Y1 is moving just that item's intercept. So maybe in the treatment and the control group, uh-oh, maybe in the treatment and the control group, that the, the people in the treatment group respond to this item slightly differently. All right, so Dan, okay, this is kind of funny. Dan is going to do exactly the plot that I did, but notice Dan cleverly has eta there instead of x, and it's exactly the same thing in looking at this. All right, so that is what it's doing is Dan draw as a slope lambda, lambda 1, all right, What's the punchline from this? Well, we can shift the mean of the latent factor as a function. Remember, population heterogeneity. We have two groups. What we're saying is their latent mean can differ. That's really important. Even their item intercept can differ, which is really important. But what sucks here? What? I'm sorry to use technical terms, but what really sucks here? It's a family here? show. It's a family show. Is... Look at these lambdas. Remember I said, what if it was 0.72? That is still 0.72 for everybody. 
What if the item intercept is, is you know, on this item here is 1.8? What if the residual variance is 6.2? We have a variance of this, right? What if we have the variance, we're going to just call that psi. These are all both implicitly and explicitly. I don't know if you can be both. I guess you're only one or the other. We are literally saying all of these other parameters are exactly equal across a group. And the only parameter that differs is the mean of eta or the mean of one of the given indicators. And so if you can sleep at night by making those equal across a group, great. But if not, we have, we're back to the same one, is what if it's 0.72 in group one, but it's 0.53 in group two? You know what? Don't care. Because we're going to make those the same value. Yeah. yeah, with the mimic approach, we really are very much limited to looking at, as Patty said, just mean differences in the factor and intercept differences in the items. We're not going to go into detail. There are mimic interaction models that try to allow for slope differences, but they have, they have their own issues, we'll say. Um, we're going to approach it differently. We're going to say, all right, well, how could we, how could we start to build in different values for these lambdas across groups? How can we build in different values, not just for the intercepts, but also those lambdas, also the sigma squares, maybe also for the factor variance. Maybe if we have two factors, right? We could have an eta for anxiety, right? What about the correlation between factors? Is that gonna be the same from one group to another? Maybe not. All right, so we're gonna reconceptualize this can I interrupt briefly? There's a really important thing in the comments. That you're taller? Yeah, I saw that. He, he wears elevated I, shoes. Yeah. <clears throat> He's only... S That's all it takes. Uh -huh. You know, it's, it's actually nicer not being taller when I'm on big airline flights. So I'll just... That's my one solace. It's kind of funny is we have lurker computers that we watch to make sure that things are working, but there's almost a 30 second delay and I just watch myself jump up and down and um, that was a little embarrassing. Yeah, you forced me to put the factors on the bottom. <laughs> All right, so here's our eta, there's our y's, right? And now what we're gonna say is this is group zero's model. And now we're going to have the same thing. Can you? Can, I'm, now you kick you, but I should. After you shut me out of the camera years. shot. Uh -huh. I'm how's still how's here. It feel? How's I'm it still feel? Here. All right. So now we're going to have sort of parallel models for group zero and for group one. All right. And each has its own factor mean and its own factor variance. Right. Each has its own set of factor loadings. Each has its own residual variances, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to approach the problem differently. We're not going to try to get at parameter differences by putting in these cross product terms, these product interactions. Instead, I'm putting this in just to that show was, that was a really important contribution. Well, it's this is okay. I have no important contributions, but these I'm just highlighting that that wasn't one model. These are are estimated right. within right. the segments. Yeah, so imagine that, imagine if you will, you <laughs> take your data set and you partition it into two data sets. You have a group zero data set and you have a group one data set. You could in principle just fit this model in group zero and you could just fit this model in group one and then everything would be different between the two groups, but then it would be hard to compare, right? Because you're not analyzing them simultaneously. What we're gonna do is kind of like that. We are going to have our data. We're going to have a grouping variable in our data that indicates which observations come from which group. But we're going to fit this kind of stratified model simultaneously, which allows us then to say, well, we could set some parameters to be the same across groups and other parameters to be different across groups. So I might, for instance, have a variance term here. And I might say, well, I think the variance might be different in this group versus that group, right? So I'm gonna estimate that variance differently. I could fit a second model where I say, no, I'm gonna say this is equal to that. 
and I could see, well, which model fits the data better? Do I need to allow for differences in variance in the factors across groups? I can do the same thing for the factor limits. Remember Patrick said this lambda 1 is 0.72, is always 0.72, doesn't matter what group you're in. Well, now I can say, well, what is it in group, oh, that didn't work well. That, well, well. that didn't work well. What is it in group 0? It might be 0.6. What is it in group 1? It might be 0.8. Right? It can take on different values across the two groups, and we can test for the equality of that. Maybe I think it's different, maybe I think it's the same. I could put in a constraint that those factor loadings are equivalent, and I could test whether they're equivalent or not. In the confirmatory factor analysis setting, one of the big things we look for is measurement invariance. How do we know that this depression factor that we're measuring in group zero has the same meaning, the same metric, the same scale, as the depression factor that we're measuring in group one. How do we know that? Well, Meredith, way back, what was this, 1990? 19... Early 90s. We'll say early, 93, I think it was. 93 is what I... Um, so Bill Meredith, brilliant guy, you know, took this idea of factorial invariance and said, well, let's really sort this out formally. Right. Back in the old days, people would do an EFA in group zero and an EFA in group one, and they'd just look at the factor pattern matrices and say, well, do they look the same or different? Well, with the advent of the confirmatory factor model, right, Sorbaum and Yoriskog and Meredith, and they said, okay, well, now what we can do is constrained estimation, so we could say, are these factor patterns the exact same or not? Right? And so Meredith worked out these different levels of factorial invariance that would allow you to make different inferences about how the factors are comparable across groups. Right? One of those being, are the factor loadings the same? Right? If the factor loadings are the same, then we have what's called metric invariance. Our factor is measured, has the same meaning, and is measured using the same units. If the intercepts are the same too, then we have what's called scalar invariance. And so we now know that we're measuring from the same point in both groups. Not only do they have the same metric, but they start from the same zero point. So the scores are directly comparable. That is super important for establishing that what you're measuring, you're measuring equivalently across groups. And it gets into issues of things like fairness of tests and do we see item bias if any of these factor loadings are different. We might conclude we have an item that is biased in one group versus another, and if we fail to detect that, we might misestimate where people lie on this latent trait. Um, so we can get into that aspect of fairness by looking at how these factor loadings differ across groups. From the standpoint of thinking about heterogeneity, what's really cool about the multiple group model is that you can choose any parameter in your model, and you can say, well, is that parameter the same or is it different? across the two groups, right? So it could be factor loadings, it could be intercepts, it could be residual variances, it could be factor means, it could be factor variances, it could be factor covariances with one another. Maybe anxiety and depression are more highly correlated in group zero than they are in group one. Pick a parameter and we can allow it to differ across groups and we can test for whether that difference needs to be there or not, right? Could we just allow, could we just have one parameter? Is one parameter good enough? Or do we really need to allow these two parameters, or this parameter to differ across these two groups? All right, so it's a really powerful way to think about observed population heterogeneity. I've got group zero, I've got group one. How do I know which parameters are the same and which parameters are different? So we are covering a boatload of material in a very brief amount of time. And so to reiterate a couple of points that Dan made, because I never have anything unique to add, I just repeat what he says and then pretend like I said it, is Meredith has four levels of what he calls invariance, right? And I'm gonna use, Dan properly use metric and scalar, but they're also a little bit more colloquial descriptions. The first that you have to meet, and these go up in order of restrictions, the first is called configural. And what that is, is does the same factor structure hold in each group? If there's one factor in the first group, is there one factor in the second group? We have to meet that 
because let's say in one group there are two factors and in the other group there's one factor, it doesn't even make sense to compare factor loadings or variances when it's a fundamentally different expression. So we first establish what's called configural. And in a very simple way, it's just do you have the same path diagram in, in the two groups. Then you move to what Dan called metric, which is in the literature sometimes called weak. And then when you move to scalar, you can go to what is sometimes called strong. And then the big kahuna is strict, where that includes the equality of the item residuals. All right, so that one's a little controversial. Yeah, you don't really want to do that. Um, it doesn't gain you anything, and you run the risk of imposing restrictions that don't really want to hold. And so, um, weak relates to the factor loading, strong relates to the item intercepts, and strict relates to the item residuals. And then, again, we're oversimplifying a lot of things, is meeting different. Um, levels of these allows you to do different things. So if you meet weak invariance, you can compare variances and covariances across group. So if you meet weak invariance, you can say there's, there's more variability in group one than there is in group two, maybe, and maybe that's some theoretical interest. Remember, in the single group model, you're making those be the same, all right? And here we're saying, no, there are more uh, there. In strong, you can compare means, all right? And at that point, you can say that depression is significantly higher in group zero than it is group one. The funny thing with strict is, yeah, it doesn't give you any additional, yeah. and so people often say, don't worry about that. The only advantage I see of strict is that it means that if you score the factor, you're scoring it with equal reliability across the two groups. But often, we're going to do this in route to a bigger SEM model, where we want to make sure ADA is measured the same way across the two groups. And then we're going to predict ADA or look at how ADA predicts other things. And so we often don't ever go about doing the scoring, and it's more important to evaluate the weak and strong or metric as scalar, yep. depending on which lingo you prefer. Um, yep. And the strict is like just the, do you really need that or not? Often not for those kinds yep. of things. And so keep, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse on this, but it's one of the really important walkaways on this is imagine this is in the pooled sample, right? We're not segmenting it on group zero and group one and we get lambdas, nus, thetas, size, all our, our parameters that we are saying are equal for all individuals. Then we take that and separate it. If we imposed equality constraints on all the parameters across the two groups, they would obtain the same values that you would have in the one group. All right, so you can think about when you estimate a single group model. Now we're focusing on a factor model, but it holds for anything you can draw. This is a latent curve model, this is a, a, a mediation model, whatever it is that you might have, is when you do a single group where you assume homogeneity, you really are doing the same thing as a multiple group, but forcing them all to be equal. What I view as the huge advantage of this framework is that a quality of parameters becomes a testable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying lambda is equal, lambda is equal, lambda is equal, I estimate one model where they're equal, I estimate one model where they freely differ, and I make it a testable hypothesis. And if the model is cool with them being equal, then impose it, and you have weak invariance. But at least you're making that decision. We're not just blindly assuming this. Why is this so important? Well, it's just what Dan talked about, is let's say that you're comparing you know, two racial groups on some any value that you have, whether it be symptomatology or whether it be some you know test or whatever it might be. I can give you a good example because I just read a master's thesis because I don't have good ideas of my own. But to steal an idea from this, imagine the latent factor is healthcare needs, and one of your indicators of that is how much how high your healthcare expenses were last year. Well, if you compare white and black subpopulations in the United States, 
that is going to be a biased indicator of health care needs because the black population is underserved relative to the white population. So if you're just going at last year's expenses, that's going to give you a biased measure of those health care needs. If, on the other hand, you looked at something like chronic conditions or a self-report of physical health, that is not going to be biased by structural racism in the healthcare system and that some populations are served better than others. So these things can be really, really important yeah. to evaluate. If all we did was take last year's health expenses as our measure of health care needs, that would be a biased indicator of actual health care needs. And how does that trickle down? We go back to using group as a predictor and making judgments about group differences, but we have a biased indicator because that indicator operates differently across the two groups. And indeed, there's a dissertation topic out there. Actually, there are entire books that could be written about this. I think a lot of conclusions that have been drawn about important subgroup differences, whether they be based on race, whether they be based on biological sex or self-identified gender. I mean, think about some big ticket important things fits a single group model and writes an entire discussion section around this single arrow, making this entire part of the model be equal across the two groups. And the thing is, is this is not some recent magical thing that has become available. We've had these methods for 40 years. This is standard um, approach that we should be using. So, and just, just to add to the worries there, let's say we pool both groups together and we fit this model. Our model fit statistics are very insensitive yeah. to the potential group differences that might actually exist. We haven't set up the model in a way that would allow us to detect the fact that that factor loading is not the same across the two groups. So fitting a single group model where we pool everyone together and saying, oh, the fit is good, that doesn't protect you. You might still be making very biased conclusions if you haven't evaluated for the potential of this heterogeneity. And indeed, the incorrect single group model often actually fits reasonably well. And picture in your mind's eye, you have a five by five covariance matrix among the items in group zero, a five by five covariance matrix in group one, when you do a pooled analysis, you only have a single five by five matrix that's the unit of analysis. Sometimes I think about it, do you ever go to Home Depot and you get the paint and there's that totally cool um, machine where it starts with white and then it squirts like the, you know, the red and the blue and the gray and then it mixes it up to give you the color? Is you're doing that. Once the paint is mixed, you can't undo the red squirt from the black squirt, that's that single matrix. And this is, we're shrugging and saying, dude, you don't have to have one matrix, you can have two. And the cool thing is, is let's say this whole thing is equal across the groups, and you do the full multiple group, you're gonna end up with the equality constraints that you have when you have a single group. But the big thing is, is you did it by choice. You did it in a principled way in building the model instead of just rocking back and forth and saying lambda is 0.72, lambda is 0.72. All right, two points I want to make. One is, is one of my favorite movies of all time is Field of Dreams. I'm not a crier. Is You're a sociopath if you don't cry at the end of Field of Dreams. <laughs> all right, and the thing there is if you build it, they will come. All right, if you haven't seen that movie, that's the assignment for next week because you have to watch Field of Dreams, especially because opening day is today for baseball. All right, if you draw it, we can estimate it as a multiple group. See, it was a long walk to get there, but I closed the loop. Provided the model's identified. He is, oh, pfft. all right. He's always in the math of it, the statistics of it. The fine print. Is the fine print. Ken Bolin, we have a colleague who talks about the fine print of statistics. All right, assuming it's it's identified, which it usually is. You've got to get a weirdo model where it wouldn't be, but it's possible. If it's a regression, if it's an observed variable path analysis, if it is a latent curve model with two you know, growth processes, 
is that if you believe there's a possibility that an estimated parameter varies in magnitude as a function of group membership we have an infrastructure that can test that all right and you should like ethically you should do those tests if you believe there's a theoretical reason where those two would differ all right so this holds for anything we just happen to drop out the factor models because that's where meredith kind of came out of historically second i'll do one fine print and toss to you mm. imagine i have a sample of 200 they all line up right in front of me and i've got a clipboard all right, and they come up and they say, um, and I say, what group are you in? And they say, one, and I say, step over there, please. Zero, over there. One, one, zero, one. These segments, these subpopulations are observed and known. You are either in zero or you are in one. There's no ambiguity about it, and you can only be in one of the two groups. That works great until it doesn't. What if someone walks up to you and you say, are right, you in group my zero or in your group one? And they say, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. And not only are they going to say, I'm not going to tell you, right? All of statistics we've established on prior episodes are just like petulant teenagers. Is it's none of your business with group, which group I'm in. But then they can do one better is they can say, and just exactly how do you know there are two groups? Maybe there are three or four, and that brings us to next week. Next week, yes, finite mixture models are an approach for looking at population heterogeneity. When you've got a group zero and a group one and maybe a group two, you're not really sure, and you don't know anyone's group membership, right? So you think there may be heterogeneity in the population, but you don't know exactly who goes where or what that heterogeneity looks like. Well, we have these models that allow us to try to look at unobserved heterogeneity. And I will avoid the temptation to start doing next week's thing, because that's <laughs> what we'll talk about next week. Um, but those are very cool, but also kind of tricky. As you can imagine, it's a little bit like trying to get blood from a stone. It's hard. It's a hard task yeah. to do. Um, so we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, and, and it really is that. It's, it's exactly the same thing, is that you believe that there may be subgroup heterogeneity in the population that is then reflected in your sample, but you don't know what that is and you don't know where people belong. It's actually, we can think about it and, and some nice writing has been done of it, is it's a missing data problem. Is we have a grouping, the part, part of the problem is we don't know how many groups, but it's just missing for everybody in the sample. And so what we try to do is a circular kind of thing where we infer the existence of the subgroups um, based on the data that we observed. Um, and so the terminology, just to clarify one last point, today was observed subgroup heterogeneity, next week is unobserved subgroup heterogeneity. And it's the same problem, we just don't know who's in which group. Yeah. Now I'm going to throw one at you. Uh oh. Let's say we have a source of observed heterogeneity, but it's not a grouping variable. Oh, this is really cool. We need a whole episode on this as well. And we, we're doing this 45 minutes in, is that you're raising this. All right, notice that was a nice throw. Well done. Thank you. It was all the planning that we put in before we did this. Yeah, we have, that's it. And we did it at 11.50. Um, is everything that we've done has been based on a single grouping variable. You're either in zero or you're one. Turns out you can do more than two groups. It's just easier to think about. You can have three groups. Let's say that you were doing, you know, some kind of work in religiosity and you had three uh, groups of, of different uh, religions. All right, just group one, group two, group three, whatever those are. You can do all of this. It's a little trickier because now like group one and two can equal, but not three, and yeah, too bad. I mean, you have a more complicated question, the analyses are more complicated. What this procedure fundamentally can't do is what if you believe the factor loading varies as a function of the child's age? Mm -hmm. And we have kids that range from 10 to 18. Well, we're dead in the water, we can't do anything with the traditional method because we have to have a factor a, a covariance matrix for group zero and for group one 
Now, I pulled you down with me on this as we actually have a paper, I don't know, it's 15 years ago, we did the IRT, the multiple group. Mm -hmm. We did a median split on age. All right, so we had young and old. We don't want to do that. Right, because we're saying everybody in group zero is exactly the same, even though they're 10 to 14 years of age. And everybody in group one is exactly the same, even though they're 15 to 18 years of age. Right, we never ever want to categorize a truly continuous variable. And so for decades, we've struggled with how to do this with a continuous covariate or multiple covariates. And that's where Dano comes in, is he developed arguably the worst acronym in all of statistics, which is moderated nonlinear factor analysis, or logically pronounced MOFA. Mona Lisa. Or Mona Lisa. And we will talk about that on another day, is what Dan came up with was a way of saying, what if I have age as a continuous measure and education and group, right? So we have three correlated covariates. I can actually predict things like a variance or a factor loading. And so we can do this, you know, looking at moderation, but that's a completely different framework and we should do a whole nother episode. We should do a whole nother episode. And um, we should probably not forget too to mention that we have like whole workshops. We have entire workshops. So we are so, we're all like the world's most horrible businessmen. Mixture models, which I think is May 15th. Yep. And then also one on measurement that gets yep. into the MNLFA model. Yep. So also I think May 15th. Yep. We don't do MNLFA in the, the measurement, but we have a oh, moderation yeah. version that'll be you know shown later. Um, and we have the free SEM workshop coming up where we talk a lot about this, you know, these kinds of things in a broader framework. We don't do the a full chapter on do we on multiple group? I don't I don't I think I don't I don't think so. I just did the notes. No, we don't. We stop at SEM. All right, but there we there you there go. Are lots well, of things. If you want to um, there are some on questions. On. <laughs> so, um, Alan has a great question. How does sample size of the groups affect the test of differences? You want to handle that? Very much like you would expect. Yeah. I mean, so it's not that different than thinking about power in a simple t-test, right? Is the, to be able to get accurate estimates of the parameters within each group, you need to have a sufficient sample size within each group. To be able to estimate parameters that are equated across the two groups, you're really looking more at the total sample size. And the power to detect differences is going to be maximized when you have equal group sizes and bigger groups. So very much like you would expect is the maximum power to detect those differences is going to be when you have the same sample size in each group. And to get accurate estimates in each group, you need to have reasonable group sizes. And that is where, you know, sometimes people say, hey, maybe the mimic is the best we can do yeah. is when you have a small sample size, there's only so much heterogeneity you can really bring into a model. And you may not be able to do the big fancy multiple yeah. group model where you could potentially let lots of things differ. You may be more restricted in what you can, can look at. I like the mimic model. Like, we can't always buy the car we want. We buy the car we can afford. And, you know, the mimic model is a nice middle ground to not doing anything at all. Um, one thing that people um, kind of misunderstand a little bit is um, the discrepancy in size is it's not quite the same as if you have the sample for group zero estimated by itself and the sample for group one estimated by itself. Because if we impose some of these equality constraints, we actually borrow information from both sides. So making up numbers is say you had a fairly complicated model where you had 50 in group zero because they're a hard to get you know, group for some reason and 150 in group one, we'd rather have equal groups. But if you're able to impose constraints, is the 50 can actually borrow from the 150, so it's not as bad. Like I've seen on a listserv where people say, well, you have to have a minimum sample size to support the estimation of each group separately, and that's not true. Yeah, yeah anything you can equate over groups is gonna help you in terms of sample size requirements, but of course, when you have small groups, it becomes harder to test whether the parameters for that group differ from 
the larger groups. So Peter, thank you for joining us again. And yes, we should have a rewards program. Next time you get early boarding, we'll let you come in because that's all it's about is just getting early boarding. Free t-shirts available in our Chapel Hill office. We don't have a Chapel Hill no, office. No one's coming. Nobody's coming. <laughs> Peter asked, does this extend if you want to look at more complex memberships, race by sex or race by SES? Um, so if they're discrete groups, I did a paper 122 years ago with Bank to Mutain where we did four groups where we had biological sex of male and female and we had ethnicity of black and white. And it was four groups, but we did the interaction. We were looking at trajectories of heavy alcohol use, and we looked at factors that pulled people out of those heavy alcohol using trajectories, and that we were able to do that. But notice it still requires discrete group membership. So absolutely, you can do that with discrete groups, and you can look at interactions. Again, you got to pay the reaper. That was, I had like a 400 line program with all the equality constraints on that, not yeah. exaggerating. Yeah. If you want to do those same things, but with continuous or ordinal or non-discrete group members, you can go to the MNLFA. Mm -hmm. And we will do a future episode on this. I'll put some of these in the show notes. Um, Dan and I have written probably more papers than we should have where... Um, you know where all this came from is Dan and I stumbled drunkenly into what's called integrative data analysis, and that is pooling multiple independent samples into a single aggregate sample and then fitting models to that. And Dan and I struggled with how do you obtain scores when you have items drawn from different samples under different, different frames located in different cities and that's where all of the MNLFA came from, yeah. was how do you build a measurement model that incorporates these study-to-study -study differences? And it wasn't until after a number of years of work we leaned back and thought, these are completely independent of integrative data analysis. They apply to anything. Yeah. So just to go back to, to Peter's question where there are two discrete grouping variables and you want to potentially look at the interaction Right, you would normally think of that as like here I've got a race variable with three levels and a sex variable with two levels. And so we would normally think of that as like a three by two kind of factorial design. In the multiple groups framework, kind of what you do is you take these six boxes yeah. and you just say, well, we've got six groups, right? We've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. And there's, there's not really the nice, clean main effect versus interaction kind of decomposition. That's sort of hard to do. Instead, we're looking at, well, you know, which among these six groups have the same values for certain parameters? And so you start getting into like comparisons across groups two, four, and six exactly. versus one, three, and five, or one and two versus three yeah, and four. One and two and three and four is what we did. Yeah. So here in the groups, you put equality on one and two, mm -hmm. and you compare that to equality on three and four, and you're actually testing an interaction. Yeah. And it's cool that you can do that, but it does, it gets complicated it's and hard. tedious, and it's not... Yeah. Uh, it's not as simple as when you're in just like a general linear model setting and you can just put in the product term. Um, but the MNLFA, one thing that's nice about it is you could build the model like the factorial model where you have main effects and interactions among variables which could be either discrete or continuous. So we really ought to maybe so talk about that at some point. Just know as we wrap up here, because we're getting a little long in the tooth, when Dan and I started this, it's like it's a hard stop at 30 minutes, no matter what, hell or high water, 30, we're at 55. You get what you pay for. But um, even if you never do a multiple group yourself, just know that when you do a single group, you really are estimating two groups simultaneously and making all the parameters be equal. Is just recognize that. And that may be fun. Right, is it's kind of like the movie Sixth Sense where the kid is like, I see dead people. It is in our work, you start seeing groups, right? Is like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And one thing is you got to dance with Hubronia, which is theory, right? Is that do you have a theoretical reason to believe that these might be different? But just simply recognize that single group models assume 
that those are homogeneous across all possible individual difference characteristics and we have the technology to actually make that a testable hypothesis. Yeah. And what's really nice, just as a kind of closing <coughs> remark, is you know if your training was in regression, right? You maybe learned how to let regression slopes differ. But what's really nice about this multiple group framework and some of the more complex things we're talking about is now you're not just limited to regression slopes. You can have any parameter potentially differ across groups. So that's that's pretty powerful and pretty cool that we can do that. Thank you, everybody. We really do appreciate your time. Dan and I have a lot of fun with this. And I mean, we put so much prep time in it as, you it's know, a labor of love, it's really. a labor of love. Those 10 minutes will never get back again. Yeah. But well spent. Well spent. Um, we hope you found this of some use. Um, and uh, oh, uh, Monday. Monday at 2. two. We're yes. in spring semester and it's like herding cats. And so we had really hoped to be the same time every time. And it's just not. I'm taking my kid out to Oregon to visit a college next week. So Monday at 2, actually we're going to do exactly the same lecture, except we've got that minor, minor problem that not only do we not know who belongs to what group, we don't even know how many groups. Take care, everybody. See ya.